We're going to start with a mi Emmer. 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 You know, for years I've been saying Emmer. Uh, Osukra. How are they doing that? Sort of. Okay, so we'll read her bio. Is an architect and valuer. She co founded Festa. Did I say that right? Okay. Feist, Feist, Feist. I mean, I have an Irish name, but that's about it. The Foundation for the Economics of Sustainability in 1998. She has taught architecture, managed a design gallery, redeveloped inner city property, worked in local community development, ran an architectural practice, and served on public and voluntary sector boards. She currently directs EOS Future Design that creates real and virtual systems for sustainable living and farms organically. Emma has written on monetary, taxation, and planning reform. She directed the Smart Tax Network funded by the Irish Department of the Environment and edited the Fair Tax Book in 2011. Take it away. great to be here. Um, I'm going to tell you the sad story of what happened in Ireland. When Alana asked me to speak at the conference, I said, you really want everybody to be so depressed about what happened? And she said, yes, yes, all of that is useful. So uh, I'll tell you what happened. Um, right. Okay, what happened? We had a boom. We had a great boom. It was, it really felt great. Um, it started more or less in the 1990s. We got uh, free money from Europe, uh, regional funding, and uh, we got a lot of uh, foreign direct investment. And all of that uh, generated a lot of uh, economic activity. And then, of course, in the way things are, a lot of the value that was created, the wealth that was created, attached to land. And in Ireland, we have widespread ownership of land. We have very high percentage of people who own their own homes, and we have uh, an, a, a small size farm structure uh, uh, throughout the country. So in general, there was a very good feel-good factor, and everybody was feeling, you know, this is good, we're coming out of our perennial undevelopment, uh, the Irish are finally coming into the world. Um, then, uh, in the year, in, in the 2000s, early 2000s, um, consumption increased. We started building more houses for ourselves. In a way, we, we weren't gaining, our productivity gains more or less flattened. We stopped gaining in terms of productivity and we started paying ourselves very well. And partly we were paying ourselves very well is because we needed to, because we had to pay our mortgages on the houses that we, we now felt we deserved. They were getting larger and uh, they were also uh, costing more in terms of the land element part of it. Um, and the banks got in in the act. Uh, essentially, there was one rogue bank, the Anglo-Irish bank, but the others followed uh, it very quickly in lending to a handful of developers, less than 10, six developers really, more or less, owed billions to the bank um, because they thought they were masters of the universe they had identified how to make money forever, uh, and it involved uh, development in Dublin, in Ireland, and in the UK, and around the world. Um, all of that, we had transaction taxes on property, so there was a lot of money coming into uh, the government coffers. So the government in the early 90s agreed this idea of social partnership, whereby the employers and the trade unions essentially and the government got together and decided what uh, uh, um, salary increases should happen broadly for the economy but mainly for public servants and it was linked to taxation so the deal was essentially we'll hold um, uh, income taxes down if you hold salaries down. But in fact, it didn't work like that. The salaries of the civil servants went up. Um, but in general, everybody was gaining. Uh, the government was more than balancing its books. Uh, we had a um, finance minister who said, basically, and his quote, his famous quote, 
if I have it, I will spend it. <laughs> um, so we were in surplus, but um, we did start a sort of small sovereign fund. But in general, in general, the money was spent um, on public service and on social benefits. Um, so meanwhile, the, the, the salaries of ordinary people in the private sector began to stagnate. And as in America, what happened was people took on debt to make up the difference. The banks got into completely Ponzi territory. They didn't have enough um, saving deposits to match the uh, uh, lending that they were doing with developers mainly, who of course sold on to uh, private owners and buying houses and the mortgages. But essentially, the greater part in the last three years before the bust, was loans to a small number of developers. This is very different from America. We didn't have a subprime situation. Um, in Ireland, people tend to pay their mortgages, and it was seen as a very safe bet. And we got bond money from Europe, but all over the world, really, into the banks to fund, basically, these developers. Okay. So, the crash. Um, 2007, the Irish banks had Best, had bet most of their resources, their savers' money and the bondholders' money, on these speculative deals, these enormous speculative deals by this small group of people. Property prices started slowing, and of course the economists, conventional economists said, we're going to have a soft landing. This is a necessary adjustment. I mean, and they say this in the face of the fact that that has never happened before in a property boom. You never get a soft landing, what you get is a crash. So while we had our own economists and our media talking up what was happening, outside investors, the bond market in particular, had a, another view of this and they particularly started attacking uh, Anglo-Irish Bank, withdrawing deposits. And quickly the other banks got drawn into this as well. And famously, uh, on a late September uh, date, I think it was the 28th of September uh, 2008, there was a late night meeting in government buildings and our finance minister, for whatever reason, when we don't know what his advice was, he was advised, I think, advised by Merrill Lynch and others, decided to guarantee all of the Irish banks. And not only the savers and depositors, but all of the bondholders, and not only the senior bondholders, but all of the bondholders, even the unsecured bondholders. Now, they thought, obviously, that it was a liquidity problem, um, but it quickly turned out to be a solvency problem. And um, in the end of the day, no matter what they did, they set up a bad bank called NAMA. They took most of the big, bad loans from those banks, they uh, discounted them by whatever 60% and they took them on their books and they felt the bank should be able to manage after that. But in, a, in, a, in effect, they couldn't manage. Uh, depositors fled, continued to flee, and um, the situation was such essentially that the uh, Irish government couldn't borrow on the bond market because they felt that uh, the economy wasn't sound, that it had made a big mistake in underwriting the banks, and in the end of the day, the, a bailout had to be uh, accepted from what's called the Troika. And uh, that was, and austerity, and balancing the books was the price of that bailout. Now bear in mind that our public finances were in surplus before the bank crisis, but after the bank crisis, not only did we have to pay back um, the uh, Troika, the receipts, since we had a property uh, collapse, had collapsed as well. So the government wasn't even bringing in the same amount of tax income as they had before, and things were looking very bad. Go on. So why, why did it happen? Okay, it did not happen because of planning regulation restricted the amount of land that was available and that drove up the value of sites. That is not what happened in Ireland. I hear this argument 
in, in the UK saying the reason why property values are going up and are now unaffordable, particularly in London, is because insufficient land is zoned for housing in particular. We had three to five times the amount of land that you could conceivably want zoned in our country around our settlements. And apart from that, we had a situation that you really didn't even need to have land zoned to get planning permission in the open countryside. And in fact, 30% of all the housing was self-built in the open countryside. So we had no restrictions really on the amount of housing that got built. So it wasn't because of restrictive planning regime that land values went up. It went up because of the availability of credit, essentially. Next. Bank, banking regulation, you can't really read this, but some people say if we'd had better banking regulation, we wouldn't have had the problem. Now there's no doubt it would have helped if we had tightened up on our regulation. In other words, if we had prevented the banks from lending more than 80% of the value of a house, for instance, to first-time buyers, or to buyers generally, and that would have, in a way, slowed down the uh, construction, the development, the exuberance and so on. Problem was, we were in Europe with an open market and we already had European banks competing with Irish banks. In fact, it was European banks were the first ones that brought in the 100% mortgages, as far as I know, and everybody then had to catch up. So you can't really easily regulate your banks um, in a small country where the money isn't your own money, you're using a third party currency and they and banks based in other countries could operate in your country under their own rules. Now in some cases they operated under Irish rules but it was possible for them to operate in Ireland uh, under regulatory rules of their base country. So it, it is the case that um, yes it's important that regulation was important but it wasn't sufficient reason. And if you look in other European countries where they had broadly the same kind of regulatory system, they didn't get the same kind of boom and bust. So what else do they have? This is the question. What was the real cause? Well, I have to talk about the home ownership incentives. This is a quote from Colin McCarthy. He's an economist operating in Ireland who likes to speak his own mind. I don't agree with him in every respect, but I respect the fact that he always uh, writes independently and is not politically beholden to anyone. And he said, basically, that imputed tax on, on housing is not taxed in Ireland. Mortgage interest, we have mortgage interest relief on, the, um, on mortgages for a long time. They're reduced, but they were, they were there consistently. Um, there's no local tax. There were no rates or property taxes on domestic dwellings in Ireland at all. And if you sold your house and it's your prime residence, there was no capital gains tax. So as he's explained, most of the developed countries may have one or two of these goodies for property owners, but only Ireland had all of them. And not only that, but there were further tax reliefs if you would build in certain uh, locations. So if you were to build along, say, the Shannon, which was an undeveloped region, or West Coast and so on, uh, you could offset the capital cost of the construction against your income tax, not just the rental income, but your income tax. So we had no real taxes on your own home. And further, we had incentives, basically, to put your money into property. And I'm quoting here Michael Hudson. He says, if you don't tax that value that attaches to land arising from the general wealth of the economy, the banks get it. And that's what happened. The banks got it. They uh, turned it into a kind of money backed by debt, essentially phony money. It wasn't backed by real pro productivity. And that uh, essentially led to the boom, and that subsequently led, led to the bust. Next. So, um, I'm an architect, so I'm interested on the physical effects of this. Very unsuitable sites were developed on uh, remote villages, uh, floodplains, completely unacceptable sites, got planning permission um, from 
connected politicians essentially, and houses were built. And, and people occupied them, certainly in the earlier part of the, the, the boom. Um, in the later part, nobody would buy them. So we now have ghost estates. Um, we have, most of our new housing was built speculatively, and we're similar to um, the UK in that regard. In other words, the builders built them and then looked for the buyers, except for the one-off houses, if you um, had lived in a rural area or your family had access to land. But most of the rest is built speculatively. So there was very little commissioned, and that has an effect on the final form. So you get identical houses, uh, effectively, in cul-de-sac estates. An estate is sort of an invented spatial form, very different from the kind of village and town form that we had in Ireland before. Of course, we had many, many one-off houses. And arising from the fact that uh, people thought a large house, the property, is wealth, you could never lose that um, in many cases where uh, young people got land for nothing from their parents, instead of saving money and building a normal side house, maybe um, 1,500 square feet, they instead built what they regard as a normal side house, which was 3,000 square feet. So they invested all of their money in constructing fancy mansions for themselves, you know, five bedrooms, and these are young people who aren't even married. And in general, because of this attitude we got from the Americans that if you own your land, you can do whatever you like with it. And that was somehow or another part of our tradition. Um, it was very difficult to oppose them. And environmental groups that did try to oppose them were demonized. Uh, placards, um, intimidation, um, editorials in, in the newspaper, and so on. So, during that time, since you could make money simply by the conversion of the land from agricultural use to a higher use, to housing use, that's where your money was made. Or if you converted uh, an inner city site, an urban site, from a lower use to a higher use or higher density use, that's where your money was made. You lost money on construction and design. That was, that was the view of the developers, generally speaking. So they minimized that. Now, in, in, in Dublin, where there was more competition, the design quality did go up because uh, you were using existing sites that had high value already, so you had to distinguish yourself with design and with construction quality. But in general, in general, we built 50% of our existing stock during that period of time and we built lousy buildings. We did not build them to the energy uh, standard that uh, was common in the rest of Europe. And the construction industry used its influence to keep the uh, standards down during that period. The opportunities of bringing in uh, shared waste and energy systems just didn't happen. So we've no combined heat and power systems like we have in other European countries. None, none of that potential to work together to collectively produce something cheaper, more efficient and better, that wasn't possible in, in the speculative kind of environment um, and the economic rewards environment of that time. Thanks. Other impacts, well, these are really important. Lack of employment now. Investment and energy and enterprise was diverted into property. Uh, people qualified in the property industries and in finance went in, all the smart guys went in there. And money was diverted enormously, private money in particular, ordinary people's <coughs> money borrowed, went into fancy houses. And that has a huge impact now. We, we don't have the level of innovation we need in terms of new businesses. But for the amount of money that was in this country, we, we never developed, for instance, on the housing side and construction side, we never developed any technology that had any value to export during that period of time, which I think was terrible waste. So we have a problem now with uh, a lack of jobs. A lot of people invested in buy-to-lets instead of more sensible pension schemes. You had the opportunity to opt for your own personal pension schemes and then, supported by their advisors and banks, 
they went in and bought buy to lets and a lot of those people and a lot of the professional class did that late in the boom when they saw they're less intelligent as they would have seen uh, compatriots in college and school get rich these were the developers the developers tended to be uh, carpenters quantity surveyors uh, brickies uh, they Whereas the professionals went to college, got secondary degrees, became doctors and accountants, and they saw these uh, C-grade guys making billions, so they got in in the act just as the boom was finishing. So a lot of our professional class now is in debt, and I think that affects a lot of the political decisions that were made. Um, we have intergenerational inequity, like if you were an older person and sold during the boom, were sensible, I have to say, that includes me, we are much more, much wealthier than uh, a cohort, say, 20 years younger, who are burdened in terrible, terrible debt, and they will never get out of it. And Irish people have an awful tendency to pay their debts. I think it's a memory of the, of the famine and being dispossessed. So we pay our debts. And, and, the, and they're working through that. And we had a draconian um, system of bankruptcy where if you declared bankruptcy, the debt attached to your house followed you and you were bankrupt for 12 years. You couldn't, become a, uh, you couldn't go into business again. Now that has been changed down to three years, but it's still the case that if you renege on your mortgage debt, it follows you. Even if you sell the house, it doesn't cover it, it follows you. So many of our young people have emigrated and we have a long history of emigration and I didn't bring up three kids for two of them to emigrate but that's what's happened mm -hmm. and it's, it's a tragedy mm -hmm. and our government takes it far too lightly as something, it's good experience, yes, but they are I think under a mis mistaken assumption that they will come back. They will not come back to a country where young people are so badly regarded. The idea of the sow that eats her young is Ireland has been described as, and in, certainly in this case, the way we fling off our young people carelessly, having educated them, and it reduces our unemployment figures to make them look good. And our young people are happy to travel, but it's, it's the surest loss of security in old age to, to dispose of our young people so carelessly. Um, damage to farming and tourism, and I'm a farmer now. We have these one-off houses all over the countryside, and that has impacts when you're trying to control animals, trying to spread slurry, various other things, even renewable energy generation. Um, and uh, tourism, of course, is badly affected. Uh, and people, tourists, can't understand why we seem to have houses in bogs and top of the mountains, here and there, all over the countryside. So, the history of land reform, and um, this doesn't read too well. Okay, I'm going to go back to the 1850s. This is after the Great Famine. If you don't know, we had a huge famine in Ireland in the 1840s, where we had 8 million people, and at the end of it, a couple of years later, we had half that. And we're actually only back up in the whole of Ireland to about 5 million now. So we're only making our numbers back now. So it was a devastating famine, the likes of which it's, it's hard to equal um, in, in uh, Europe. It was the last great European famine, and I think it's affected and scarred our mentalities in many ways and our hunger for land. But uh, following that, there was a move for land reform, and the call was for three Fs, which were fair rent, fixity of tenure, and free sale of, ten of tenants improvements. That's essentially, but when you boil it down, essentially, it accords with Henry George's principles. And he came over during that time and influenced Michael Dallet, who is the leader of the land reform movement. But during that struggle, the, the agenda changed, and the agenda changed to the right to buy. And Henry George was worried about that, and, and Michael Dallet was even more worried. And what happened was that the tenant farmer, the head tenant, essentially got the right to buy. So over time, that increased to the point in, to 1903, they had the right to buy out their landlord, whether he liked it or not, and they were compensated with bonds. And that's when the great land transfer happened. And that's why in Ireland, most of the land is owned fairly broadly by the people of Ireland, unlike Britain, where the land is still owned 
by the Normans, their descendants. Um, 1916, we had our, the beginnings of our uh, struggle for independence, and uh, Porrick Pierce was an important leader at that time. And Porrick Pierce, at that stage, most of the land transfer had happened, and yet he still felt we needed our revolution, even though the land had been distributed, because he said the land was for the people, not for the farmers or for the, for the relatively few rich. Um, the 1950s in Ireland, we had extreme underdevelopment. Uh, we had a political system that didn't believe in trade, free trade, we had protective industries, and we had very undeveloped farming. And uh, our homegrown economist, uh, Raymond Crotty, a remarkable man, wrote a book on agriculture, the uh, best book on agriculture, Irish agriculture, I think, since, since even to now. And uh, he said the problem was in Irish agriculture, there's no investment in infrastructure, nobody's employed because the farmers got the land too cheap. All they have to do is basically let the grass grow, uh, the cattle eat it, the cattle are exported to Britain, they do very well, their inputs are slight, their income is relatively high. But the problem is that productivity was low, there were no jobs created in Ireland, there was no follow-on industries created in Ireland. Because when you look after the landowner, you destroy the community and the people. And he said the answer was a land tax, an agricultural land tax, which is equivalent to the conacre value of the land, which is the full rental value of land. And he would exempt only family farms that he saw were actually uh, quite productive. That was completely forgotten about and, and pushed aside. And very, people know, very few people know that, that Raymond Crotty advocated a land tax. And instead, around that time, uh, our Taoiseach at the time, Le Mas, uh, with Whitaker, who's a senior civil servant, decided it was time to open up Irish economy to outsiders for direct investment. And that's what happened. We got our lower tax rates, we got the big um, companies coming in, transnational corporations coming in, and Ireland had its first sort of mini boom. And to a certain extent, it began to stem the tide of emigration. In fact, I was born in Africa because my parents had to emigrate. And uh, as professionals, they worked in Ghana. Um, and then they went to America briefly, but they came back in the 60s because jobs started happening. Um, so, in the 60s, wealth again came into the country, and then we began to see land speculation for the first time. And there was a great need for housing, and vast areas were zoned, and fortunes were made, mainly by politically well-connected developers for the first time. And it was so egregious and obvious that there was a call for some kind of control. And a report was made called the Kenny Report, and people talk about this famously. And this report said that all land that is needed for development should be bought at agricultural price plus 20%, and then developed by uh, the local uh, council. Now, it didn't happen. It didn't happen for lots of reasons, but the main reason is that that land was owned by politically connected people, and it wasn't going to happen. But also, I feel it was actually impractical when you think about it. So we soldiered on. One. Next. Um, Getting a bit on time here. Okay, I better hurry up. Um, I, 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 did you skip a couple of them? Because we, we just go back. No. Okay. And go on again. Don't think I've missed anything. Okay, oh, okay. There it's there. Nice. Oh yeah. Um, in the 1990s, they, 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 we had a bit of a recession, so they increased the tax incentives for property. And um, we had social partnerships going through this. 2003, my little NGO called FASTA, Foundation for the Economics of Sustainability, we, I had become uh, acquainted with Henry George's ideas. And it wasn't hard for me to be sold in it because I had trained as a valuer. And if you're a valuer, it immediately makes sense. So we had a conference in 2003 called Land, the Unfinished Struggle, and um, Alana and many others were there. And we said there is going to be a crash because it cannot continue like this. But we weren't heard. 
It continued up until 2007. Um, so, I mean, actually, I've partly gone over this again, so we'll just, just move on there again. Yeah. Smart Taxes was a, uh, a network of people interested in taxation reform, and in particular in land value taxation reform. It was led by FASTA. We got money from the Department of the Environment, and we made a decision that we would pull in disparate people, people who only agreed on one thing, but may have ideological differences in other areas. So we had left and right-wing economists. We had George's uh, School of Economics and Philosophy in Dublin. Um, we had environmentalists, we had planners, and we had architects. We did our research. We, um, we had a number of conferences. We put up a website. We um, briefed politicians. And we finally produced a book. We persuaded the Green Party to take on the land value tax issue. They got into power after uh, Fianna Fáil lost its election when the property boom occurred and the Troika had to be called in, essentially. But um, actually, they, they, they came back in with Fianna Fáil at that, at, at that point. Uh, they, they lost seats, but not enough to lose power with the Greens. And then the Troika came in because the uh, bank crash happened and we had a new government and we were all set to have land value taxation because at that point it was accepted. The property market had got out of hand and something had to be done. The OECD had supported it and various other studies had supported it. But as soon as the new government came in, it threw out anything that was tainted by the last government. Mm -hmm. And the concerns of the the country turned towards the banking crisis from the property crisis, essentially. And you couldn't get any discussion about any kind of reform or innovative reform in property taxes. And in the end of the day, the OECD insisted on some form of domestic property tax, and they brought in a conventional property tax, which excluded all zoned land and empty sites. And in Ireland, that accounts for 30% of the total land that you could have um, taxed. So despite all that, we failed. So I mean, the faults of the uh, residential property tax, for a start, it excluded 30% of the land that could have been taxed. Now that land was now owned by the banks and the bad banks. And the problem was, I think, that the government didn't want to make the balance sheets look any worse than they were. They are still insolvent, our banks, but, the, but our government is still trying to pretend that they're not. So I think that was the real reason why they didn't uh, go for a land value tax. What they said was the reason why we didn't have a land value tax because they didn't think the Irish people would understand it, basically. Um, so they did bring in this 80% tax on new zoned land. So if you get your land zoned from agriculture now, you have to pay an 80% tax on it. But since we have five times as much land as we will ever want, that is unlikely to happen. And of course, as an architect, it's ridiculous because if you improve your home, and we do need to upgrade all of our houses because they were badly built during that uh, boom period, um, you are going to have to pay extra tax at the very time when the construction industry is on its knees. So, next. Now, um, that was it, in a way. Um, we let it go. That was our best chance, and our best chance passed. Um, and there is very little, there is no funding available anymore. There is no funding at all for NGOs. What, what was there before has gone. Austerity uh, has stopped any public funding. The private sector in Ireland doesn't tend to fund foundations. It tends to fund poverty programs, but not uh, economic or progressive movements. So there is no money. It, it's, it's all done voluntarily. And a lot of people got burnt out during that, during that period. But I think we had an effect. Um, and I am hopeful for the future. For instance, for the first time ever, there was a call for an agricultural land tax. 
And this is something we never dared hope we would get in Ireland because we restricted our call to a site value tax to exclude agricultural land because we didn't want the farmers up against us as well as the developers. But a farmer, a farmer, a TD, an elected representative was calling for an agricultural land tax because the new cap, the new agricultural um, payment system is now going to pay people according to the amount of land they own, not related to productivity. And that causes a whole pile of problems about uh, progressive farmers getting access to land. So for the first time ever, we've seen land tax in the Irish Farmers Journal. So the discussion is happening. Excellent. We see a call for a site value tax on derelict sites from inside of local government. A senior, the senior planner and uh, local government in, in Dublin City Council is calling for an annual tax on empty sites. And we have many prime sites that didn't get developed in the boom. And we all know that, that that's what happens because uh, those who own very valuable sites, uh, long in pocket, can wait until the optimal time before they sell or develop. In many cases, they miss time and that site doesn't get developed. So we have prime sites in Dublin City which are sitting idle and they want a land tax or a site value tax. And we had nothing to do with it. This came from the bureaucrats inside the system. Excellent. This is an important one. This is a struggle that is happening now that came from nowhere. And it's renewable energy and it's because we have excellent resources in this country for wind. And developers are going around the country offering landowners 18,000 per annum per turbine to site their turbine on their land. And the kind of land that is suitable for turbines tends to be commons land, the tops of mountains that was used to graze sheep, and it got divided up. So the poorest of farmers now have that land, now it's become the richest of farmers. And um, community groups, there's a lot of impacts on these turbines. These are very large turbines. And remember, I'm an environmentalist, and in theory, I'm in favor of wind energy. But there's huge impacts of these turbines. It affects property values, it affects what else can be done, it affects tourism, um, it affects health potentially because the larger the turbine, it changes the character of the sound. And the developers figure they can pay off communities by building the odd uh, swimming pool and so on, and it's causing an enormous reaction. Please. Thanks. So, we're getting marches, we're getting protests. We're getting uh, people saying they're going to put up wind farm protest candidates in the next local election. And one of the reasons why we're getting it, apart from the generalized huge increase, influx of planning permissions for large scale uh, wind farms, is that one or two of our homegrown wind developers are planning to use our midland worked out bogs, which is the middle of Ireland, low wind resource, lower relatively speaking to the west coast, to build enormous turbines, five megawatt, twice the size of the three megawatt ones, in order to sell electricity directly to the UK through their own interconnector. Which is unbelievable to think about. And uh, huge pressure is being put on our uh, Minister for Finance to do this deal, essentially. And the payoff is that um, local landowners will get rents, and of course, the state owned Board Namuna company that owns the bogs will get rents. And we will apparently, if you can believe them, get construction jobs during the construction phase. And those same developers, meanwhile, are, 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 have affected uh, development of turbines in the rest of the country because the fact that they can connect to the larger British grid has made their uh, farms potentially valuable. And fortunes are being made. And it smells very like the property boom to me. And if you look, if you, uh, people are, are getting permission and flipping. And they're selling on to uh, hedge funds, apparently, and uh, sovereign funds. So this is basically a question of who owns this value. And here is an opportunity, I think, to change the discourse to 
Who owns the wind? Is it the developers? Is it the owners, the investors? Is it the landowners? I think, I think it's easy to sell the idea that no, it's owned by the people of Ireland and most of that value should be taxed out. Next, next one. So, this is the last one. Um, we didn't get taxation reform because we weren't looking at money reform at the same time. I, I think you, they go together. Um, if the banks and the boom worked together with the land market for what happened in Ireland, and they both have to be fixed together, this is not possible to fix one without the other. We need to engage pro progressives, the left wing as allies. They were some of our biggest enemies because they said the only taxation that is fair is progressive income tax and wouldn't accept any tax that wasn't progressive, so-called. I think that we won the economic argument. It, it's a political movement now and we should get involved in political parties and stop being apart and different. We have to hold our nose and join up with those guys and, and persuade them from the inside because when you're from the outside and a crisis occurs, they don't listen to you. You have to be one of them. And then I, I think we have to make common cause with the youth, with the new movements that are happening, the peer-to-peer -peer movement, the commons movement. That's our movement. That's where we should be. We should be situated there. We should talk less about Henry George and talk more about the future. And then to be more flexible. Um, it's, we, we can teach about land value by talking about the new values that are created from the earth, like renewable energy, wind, which had no value before. We have a better chance there. We should focus on that. Thanks.